Welcome to Cool Talk. Today we study the independence movements of South America with special attention on Simon Bolivar, the great liberator, a man instrumental in obtaining independence for Venezuela, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, a landmass larger than Western Europe. In his military trails, he traveled across three times the area that Napoleon did. He fought 472 battles with a unified front of whites, blacks, mestizos, mulatos, indios, former slaves, along with many foreign mercenaries and officers. He would put together an army, lose it, put one together again, recruiting even old men and 12-year-old boys. Women would join the movement. His troops would sleep on the ground with him, cross days of rivers, swamplands, plains, and even the Andes Mountains. And in the end, he kicked the Spanish Empire out. Yet, he failed to achieve his dream that these independent nations would become one unified federation, a powerful force against imperialistic Europe. Yet his failure was larger than most of the greatest successes. Let's begin. The Bolivars were one of the wealthiest families in South America. His father, Juan Vicente Bolivar, married his mother, Maria de la Concepcion, in 1773. He was 46, she was 15. Bolivar was born in 1783, but by the age of nine, both his parents had died of tuberculosis. So naturally, Coming from a wealthy family, his relatives went out of their way to raise him or earn his graces. But Bolivar mostly cared for his nurse, a slave woman named Hippolyta. He referred to her as the only mother he had really known. Simón Bolivar went to Europe to get an education. At the age of 18, he married Maria Teresa del Toro. He brought her to his native Caracas, Venezuela, where sadly she died just one year later of yellow fever. At the age of 19, Bolivar was a widower. Devastated, he swore he would never marry again, though he did have numerous affairs. The most lasting one was with an Ecuadorian woman named Manuela Sanz. Now, she would later become a revolutionary heroine herself during the wars of independence, and she even saved his life once, but that comes later. He went to Europe where inspired by philosophers and passion by the rebellions that were going on in South America, he made an oath that he would not rest until he saw South America free from Spanish rule. Now this is pretty idealistic for a young man, but he was also pragmatic. He knew three things. South American inhabitants were very uneducated thanks to Spain keeping them in line. Number two, that the hodgepodge of races would have to unite to defeat Spain. And most important, three, that it wasn't enough to free his native Venezuela. He had to free the neighboring countries as well to keep the Spanish from coming back. He had to free the nations and then unite them as one. Now that is a tall order. Now rebels were already conspiring in secret in Venezuela. Bolivar joined a junta that was going to send a delegation to the United Kingdom to gain recognition for their cause. Now, Bolivar was allowed to go with the delegation, even though he was young, brash, and outspoken. Why? Because he was rich, and he was paying for the whole trip. Well, they didn't impress the British, but they did manage to attract Francisco de Miranda, a Venezuelan revolutionary who had fought in the American and French movement of independence. Miranda became his mentor, and Miranda was brought to Venezuela. Bolivar was made a colonel. The war for independence had begun. A few battles later and the First Republic of Venezuela was formed, but a royalist named Domingo de Monteverde struck back at the rebels. And when Bolivar lost control of the San Felipe castle and the munitions that were there, Miranda saw this as a lost cause. Without consulting his fellow rebels, Miranda signed an armistice with Spain and ended the First Republic. Now Bolivar and his men were furious he notified the Spanish of Miranda's whereabouts. Royalist soldiers took Miranda away to a Spanish prison where he died a few years later. The movement would continue. In 1813, Bolivar began the admirable campaign and he captured Merida, Barinas, Trujillo, and Caracas and freed Venezuela from Spanish control in one year. He was 30 years old. But during the campaign, Bolivar proved that he could be cruel. In response to reported Spanish atrocities, he signed a decree of war to the death, 
which allowed Spaniards, even civilians who didn't support the independence movement, to be killed. He would later show even more cruelty when he emptied out entire prisons of royalists and had them all executed. The Second Republic of Venezuela was born on August 6, 1813, but it wouldn't last. A royalist named José Tomás Boves joined Monteverde's forces and retook Caracas. The Second Republic fell. Bolívar fled, and he made his way to Haiti to ask for assistance. In Haiti, a decade earlier, there had been a slave revolt led by Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint succeeded but was captured by the French. Jean Jacques Dessalines would continue the movement and declare Haitian independence on January 11, 1804. He was later assassinated and Alexander Pétion became president. It was Pétion who received Bolívar and promised him that if he freed all the slaves in Venezuela, he would help him. And so Bolívar did. He returned to Venezuela with Haitian soldiers and ammunition. He freed the slaves as promised angering the slaveholders, and the revolution would continue. Now, in the struggle, Bolivar had a plan to cross over the Andes to get to New Granada, which is in today's Colombia, and attack the Spanish there by surprise. But to do this, he and his troops would have to travel for eight days by raft and canoe along the Arauco River, then cross the often flooded plains of Casanare, waist deep in water, all the while with under torrential rain. They would meet with General Francisco Santander, who brought along 1,200 men to join the struggle. They finally reached the Andes Mountains and began to climb to about 4,000 meters. Many were not dressed for the impending cold. Some of his Irish mercenaries died of altitude sickness. They slaughtered their horses and animals and ate raw meat. Then came pounding hail. Look at this picture of this young woman who had been trapped in a hailstorm. Along after that came the strong winds, and then came the snow. And when they came down on the other side of the Andes, they had lost over 2,000 men. Those who survived were exhausted, their clothes tattered. But Bolivar got the locals to help refit his men, and he wasted little time resting. They attacked the royalists by surprise, won the Battle of Boyacá, and New Granada was free. The Republic of Colombia was established, and afterwards, they liberated Ecuador. And then came the famous Conference of Guayaquil, where Bolívar met with Argentine General José de San Martín. San Martín had also marched his own troops over the Andes to liberate Chile and also Argentina. So these two giants, these two legendary men got together. Now, San Martin was the one that requested the meeting. He had just taken the city of Lima and was asking Bolivar to combine their forces and liberate the rest of Peru. San Martin even said that he would serve under Bolivar. Bolivar would be the commander. Now, if you look at this map and keep in mind that Brazil is now a constitutional monarchy, who was separated from the Portuguese, and noticed that the arrow was not pointing at Argentina, which should have been included, you could see that if they took Peru, they would have conquered most of South America. Now, some say that San Martin decided that he would serve under Bolivar because San Martin was sick. We don't know, but the point here is that Bolivar turned San Martin down. San Martin went away to retire. And then Bolívar, along with his general, Antonio José de Sucre, went out there on their own and they liberated Peru. By August 6, 1825, a part of Peru would separate and create a new republic, and they would name it after their liberator, Simón Bolívar. They called this region Bolivia. And when the wars were mostly over, came the hard part. Everybody cheered the independence. But across the territory, entire cities and villages had been destroyed. Crops were unattended. Over 600,000 people had died. It was time to rebuild, but there was no money. And there was also a lot of class division. All these people that Bolivar had united, he united them against a common enemy. But now they had to work together. Now, he did free the slaves, so that's a good thing. 
but he was unable to get these different mestizos and indios, mulatos and whites to join forces and work to form the new nations. Now, while Bolivar was fighting in the regions of Peru, he had left Santander to run things in Gran Colombia. Now, keep in mind that the region of Gran Colombia is actually Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. Anyway, Santander was the vice president. Bolivar was the president. And Santander was pressured to keep sending money to Bolivar to fund the armies and at the same time run the country. And since many of the taxes that the Spanish had placed on the citizens had been removed by Bolivar, there was less revenue. Throughout the region, the differences were very pronounced. Peru saw the Venezuelans as outsiders, as foreigners. And Bolivar, who was now president of Peru, Gran Colombia, and Bolivia, was making people consider him a bit of a monarch, a king. Now, Bolivar worked hard on the Constitution, which would abolish slavery, guarantee freedom of the press, and establish a legal system with trial by jury. But the Constitution also stipulated that the president would be president for life. Now, many people are angry about this. Peru accepted this because the army was still there. Bolivia didn't uh, agree to this until Bolivar, to calm people down, said that Sucre would be the president instead for about two years. The different countries had different heads of states, men with ambitions of their own, and the people didn't want anything to do with each other. Why should the Venezuelans suffer just to fund an army in Peru? This and other thoughts prevailed, and the people felt worse off than they had under the Spanish. The divisions grew, and congresses were fractioned. Then, one of Bolivar's beloved generals from the early days, a General Jose Antonio Paez, took matters into his own hands and led a rebellion to separate Venezuela from the Gran Colombia. Now, Peru decided it wanted to separate, and Vice President Santander was ecstatic. Gran Colombia would no longer have to foot the bill for Peru. But this, of course, went against Bolivar's plans. One by one, the regions broke apart as nation among nation threatened to leave. Bolivar would rewrite constitutions, call congresses together, walk around, go into cities, cheer, and speak. But this only served to feed the thought that he was a dictator. Many thought, let it go, man, you had your shot, especially those who did not share his dream of a federation. Assassination plots were discovered, and Bolivar would have enemies executed. A necessary measure, perhaps, but it didn't help his image. And Santander, suspected of conspiracy, was jailed. Then his health betrayed him. Consumption or tuberculosis attacked his body, which grew increasingly thin and weak. And then his right-hand man, Antonio José de Sucre, president, of Bolivia was assassinated. Simón Bolívar concluded that it would continue in chaos if he stuck around. So on January 20, 1830, he announced that he would step down from the presidency of La Gran Colombia. He made one last impassioned speech to the citizens for unity, but the resentments ran too deep. And in many areas of Venezuela, he was banned. He decided that he would go to Europe with his lover, Manuela Sáenz, but he was broke. Once one of the wealthiest men in South America, he had now spent his last dime liberating the nations that wanted him gone. He had to sell his silverware to fund the trip. Now, he made his way to Cartagena to wait for his lover, Manuela Sáenz, to arrive, and then they would sail off to Europe together. But he became bedridden. And surrounded by some of the few friends that he still had remaining, he wasted away. He coughed and held on, knowing that Manuela Sainz was on her way. But his body gave out before she could arrive. He died on December 17, 1830. He was 47 years old. After his death, South America suffered 200 years of caudillos, populist strongmen who led as dictators, their political parties really just a cult of personality. 
Santa Ana, Batista, Torrijos, Castro, Noriega, Strasner, Pinochet, Trujillo, Perón, and others. Yet, as high as Bolivar had climbed and as far as he had fallen, history has a way of reassessing, even rewriting itself. Today, his statue is seen across several nations on several continents. He is a symbol of idealism and dreams where anything is possible, embraced by the left and the right, a man of contradiction, the start of Latin America's ability to overlook the imperfection in its heroes. And after all, he did get the Spanish out. And by freeing the slaves 50 years before the United States would have the Emancipation Proclamation, Bolivar had affected the lives of millions pertaining to his generation and generations to come. So perhaps his dream is still alive, as millions of people across the world see his idealism as something to strive for, the power of the imagination. Now, even though we already studied Egypt, Carthage, and the ancient African empires, it's time to once again revisit that continent. The videos have become a little bit Eurocentric. So we're going to revisit the continent of Africa up to the 19th century. But until then, send me your comments, or better yet, subscribe. This is Cool Talk.